Hey Generations, it is, I believe, the 28th or 29th of June, but we're in the past, but in the future, and I will pray and we will sing, and I've got some teaching from Philippians. Here we go. Father, I pray regularly, all the time, help me to see things as they are, help us to see things as they are, and help us to make much of Jesus. This is a weary world. We pray these things in His name, amen. can separate even if I ran away cause your love never failed I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercies for me every day cause your love never fails Stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never the wind is strong and the water's deep But I'm not alone here in these open seas Your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side But your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the Oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Your love never fails You make all things Work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good Same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. 
Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations My Savior, He can move the mountain My God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me all my fears and failure fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender my Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave my Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king my savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day and there may I though vile as he wash all my 
sins away Wash all my sins away Wash all my sins away And there may I though vile as he Wash all my sins away Dying them, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no By way of reminder, Team Generations, we are in the middle of a series about joy, and we are basing it from Paul's letter to the book of Philippians, and uh, I just want to pick things back up. We're back in Philippians 4, 8 today. I spent a lot of time around couples who are about to get married, and I'm going to tell you that these people have joy. They have joy in spades. They're excited, they're positive, they're focused on the future in a way that's good. And while the wedding as an event can be kind of stressful for them, uh, their focus is typically in the right place. Again, they're focused on the positive traits of their fiance. They're focused on their life together. One of the things that I'll have a young couple do who's about to get married is I'll ask them, name two or three things about your fiance that you admire. And inevitably, one of them will, will in the moment go on and, and be on thing number four or five or six, and then they'll catch themselves and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I went over. Take a couple who's been married 15 years and ask this question, name two or three things that annoy you about your spouse. Oh, just two or three, huh? I got a long list. What's true about couples who are about to get married, what's true about couples who've been married a long time is true of you and me. There is a profound connection between what you think and how you feel. Let me say that again. There is a profound connection between what you think and how you feel. Now, because you and I are Americans, we are typically oblivious to this link, to this connection. We happen to think, well, I, I just feel what I feel and it just happens. It's the couple who pledge to love, honor, and cherish one another, but who now suddenly find that they don't feel in love anymore. It's the boy band that announces they're splitting up after their world tour because they feel it's time to move on. I knew a lady in, uh, at the mothership, at the mother congregation where I pastored, who came into the congregation and she had had an affair with a married man who also happened to be a pastor in this community. <gasps> now, she was convinced that everybody in the church was silently judging her and condemning her. And I could not convince her that one, no one in the church knew, and two, even if they did, they didn't care. Those feelings that she had, those strong emotions of feeling judged and shamed and condemned, drove her out of that, congrega out of that congregation and far, far away from God. 
On any given day, you and I feel all kinds of things, happy, sad, angry, frustrated, delighted, excited, scared, bored. Those feelings are not random occurrences. They're not. They're connected to your thoughts. They're connected to your thought life, to what you're thinking. And that's today's bottom line. You will always feel what your mind dwells on. You will always feel what your mind dwells on, which is why Paul begs the Philippian Christians to do this in chapter four, verse eight. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Last week, I asked you to shift your focus from the to-do list and from what went wrong to your blessings, strengths, and goals. And today, I want to make the connection between your thoughts, feelings, and actions. And so I want to spell out that connection. And in order to do that, I brought along a picture. Your feelings are like the typical pot of water that's sitting on top of a stove or a burner and that's beginning to boil. And so your feelings are, is the boiling water inside that pot. Now what happens is we typically focus on the feelings. And so the way that we'll deal with this potting, uh, boiling pot of water is that we will dump ice into the pot. Will that stop it boiling? Absolutely, for a little bit. But because the burner is still on, that water is going to come to a boil again. The burner is your thought life, is what you're thinking. And so if you want the water to stop boiling, you've got to turn off the, the burner. What are some of the things that we do when we're pouring ice in this proverbial pot? Uh, for a long time, uh, when I was younger, if I was feeling really discouraged or I had a lot of negative emotions, what I would do is I would eat ice cream. Ice cream is like dumping ice in that boiling pot of water. Some people will use pornography or they'll do any kind of addictive behavior, something to soothe the negative emotion, uh, negative emotions and negative emotional thinking that they have and feelings that they have. But again, until you address your thought life, you're not going to make progress when it comes to those strong, powerful, negative emotions. You got to turn off the heat. Paul says this in Philippians 4, 4, always, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. That's great, Paul. How? <laughs> How do we do that? How is it the case that we can have joy like that on a regular basis in the Lord? He spells it out in verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You have joy and you increase joy in your life by intentionally addressing your thought life. This big idea is actually demonstrated in living color with the 12 spies who were sent out to scout the promised land. And their encounter is recorded in the book of Numbers, chapters 13 and 14. So get this, the Israelites have been freed from Egypt. They've been on their way to the promised land and they get to the boundary of the promised land. And so Moses sends out 12 spies, 12 men to scout things out and get a lay of the land. 12 spies are sent out to determine, oh, look, there are some really good vineyards here. And oh, look, there's some, there's some mountain ranges here and a river runs this way. And, and there's a fortified town here and there's a smaller city over there. They're sent to get a lay of the land. Now, when they come back, 
they give two different reports. All 12 men saw the exact same things. And yet those two reports couldn't be more different. 10 spies give this report and it's recorded in Numbers 13 verses 27 through 29. This was their report to Moses. Well, we entered the land you sent us to explore and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But, but, the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. Why, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The people are powerful, the towns are fortified, and they're giants. Well, two spies, Caleb and Joshua, give a different report. Caleb says this in verse 30. Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the Israelites latched on to the report from the 10 spies. Gang, fear sells. People latch on to fear, okay? And so God punishes them. God spells out consequences and says, for every day these spies sent scouting out the land, you're gonna spend a year wandering around in the wilderness. Numbers 14 verses 23 and 24 puts it this way. They will never see the land I swore to give their ancestors, God says. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb, Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. Catch it? Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He's remained loyal to me, so I'll bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. If Caleb were wearing a Christian t-shirt, you know what it would say? Some people see giants, I see a mighty God. Booyah! Right? Caleb's attitude is different. So gang, here's the thing. Your thoughts produce feelings and your feelings produce actions. This is the way it works. This is how these things are all connected. Your emotions are actually taught. What you feel is actually tied to what you think. Ultimately, what you think and how you're thinking informs everything. It informs what you're feeling and your feelings translate into actions. This is huge. Now, one of the biggest issues that tr that, that uh, causes you and I to trip up and causes you and I problems and causes you and I issues are rats. We got rats running around in our minds, rats running around in our thought life, and rats are really awful thoughts. R-A-T-S, really awful thoughts. Rats. Rats are spelled out by Tommy Newberry in his book, The 4-8 Principle and their crooked thinking patterns that take root and run loose in our thought life and rob us of joy. And so I wanna share nine different kinds of rats that can be running around in your thought life that could be literally sucking joy right out of your soul. The first kind of rat is amplifiers. Amplifiers. Amplifiers are the extreme words, always, Never, no one, every time. You always, you never, you know, every single time, I, right? So amplifiers often appear in two key relationships, marriage relationships and parenting relationships. And so if you find those words coming out of your mouth or coming towards you on a regular basis, you got some rats loose in, in, the, in your thought life. The second kind of rats are feelers, feelers. You have a negative feeling 
about something or a situation and you immediately assume, assume that your feeling is true and accurate without question, without evaluation. A third kind of rat that you can have running around in your thought life is guessers, guessers. Guesser rats are pretending to know what other people think. And, and so you, you know, you just know in your mind and your heart what other people are thinking and you assume the worst. Again, without evaluating, without asking, without clarifying. Fourth kind of rat is exaggerators. Exaggerators. These are the drama queens and drama kings. Um, they love to use these trigger words, exaggerators do. Horrible, worst, ruined, shocked, devastated, stunned, outraged. We live in a culture of outrage. And these are exaggerators. These are rats running around the mind, uh, around your mindset, around your thought life. Fifth kind of rat, identifiers. Identifiers, rats work this way. Uh, everything that happens is somehow connected to me and whatever happens to me is done with malicious intent. So if I'm driving along US 27 and someone cuts me off, it's not that they were just not paying attention to the road, it's that they know it's me and they did that intentionally, jerk, right? So there's uh, identifiers, they're connecting things to me with malicious intent. Forecasters are another kind of rat. Uh, forecasters spell out a worst case scenario, worst case scenario. And they say, oh my goodness, this is going to be the worst vacation ever. This is all going to fall apart. The project's going to fail and flunk. And so at the very beginning of something, they assume that they know exactly how it's going to play out and it's going to be absolutely terrible. Then there are cynics, the cynic rat. If 10 good things happen and three bad things happen, the cynic fo focuses on the three bad things and cannot even see the 10 good things. Cynics don't notice the good stuff that's happening. Another kind of rat, the blamer rat. You point your finger at other people for your problems. My coach, my parents, my boss, my school. If it weren't for these things, I would have. It's their fault. And then the last rat that can run around and wreak havoc in your thought life are the justifiers. I have a right to feel this way, the justifier rats say. If only you knew what he did, if only you knew what she did, I deserve to be this upset. Let me ask a question. Do you have some rats running around in your brain? Do you have some rats who are robbing you of joy. And then secondly, do you suffer from ongoing negative feelings? Do you feel stuck? And then lastly, would you be willing today, would you be willing today to consider the possibility that your feelings don't just happen, that they are in fact tied to what you're thinking? And would you be willing to get rid of some of the rats running around in your thought life? Try to make these things practical. So what are some ways that you can take this home? First of all, I want you to recognize that the ownership of your emotional life is yours and yours alone. I have to say to myself, the ownership of my emotional life, Max Vanderpool, is mine and mine alone. No one makes you feel angry, sad, happy, da, da, da. They do not have that power over you. It, now, this isn't a denial of feelings. This is simply taking responsibility for your thought life. The second thing is I want you to understand that sometimes your emotions will be wrong, okay? Sometimes what you're feeling on the inside is not what's happening in the outside around you. Sometimes it is, and you're, you're spot on. You're accurate. You're right. But sometimes you're not. And so you have to do the hard work of evaluating your feelings and your emotions and then doing the detective work to figure out if that's really what's going on out there. Third, 
Ongoing negative emotions, these rats that we talked about, signal that your mental health is suffering. It's a giant flag that says, oh, danger, okay? And so here's what I wanna tell you about the rats that you may have running around in your thought life or ongoing negative emotions. One, you shouldn't suppress it. So it's not a good idea if you have all this ongoing negative emotion to just stuff it down and pretend that it's not there. Trust me, I did that in life. Not healthy, not helpful. The second thing is, it's not a good idea to just blurt it and, and bleh, puke it at everybody around you. So don't suppress it and don't express it inappropriately, but replace it. I'm going to give you seven steps from Tommy Newberry. Seven steps. One, when you have these ongoing negative emotions, acknowledge them. Acknowledge that they're there. Acknowledge them and name them, okay? They're a warning light on the dashboard of your car. Pay attention. Something's up. Secondly, put them in their place. Do the homework to figure out, are these feelings true? Are they legitimate? Is that what's really going on around me? Third, own them. I am responsible for my life. I am responsible for my feelings. Own it, okay? Fourth, toward, turn toward the big picture. For a lot of us, we have a lot more good in our life than we realize. And so looking at the big picture can put things in perspective. Fifth, drop the thought. Let it go. Sixth, you may need to retreat. You may need to step back to cool off, to isolate, to cool down. And lastly, practice compassion for the other person, right? the other person. One of the rats, one of the really awful thoughts that I used to have in my life was the cynic, okay? I would see, I would focus on the things that were bad. I would, I would see the bad and I would focus on the bad. So over the past few years, I've done two things to kind of combat that and change that in my life. The first thing is every single day, I, I write down, I actually write down in a journal the answer to this question. What am I thankful for right now? This morning, as I was answering out that question, I was thinking of Bob and Jama Martin, part of our church family, and some things they've done for me and for the church and the kind of people that they are. Put a smile on my face as I was writing that down, okay? What am I thankful for right now? I do that every single day. And the second thing that I, that I changed is every single week, I write down, again, I write it down on a piece of paper, the five biggest wins from the week. These are accomplishments, things I'm proud of, but I write them down. And what I found is that on days when I'm battling discouragement, on days when I'm tempted to let that cynic rat run amok in my thought life, I pull open those notes and I'm like, oh my goodness, look at all the good things that are happening. It helps my perspective. Gang, you will always feel what you dwell on. It's important to dwell on the right things. Paul has it right when he says this in Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Gang, I believe in you, I love you, and I will see you around the church house in July.